with this talk i aim to update you regarding what's there regarding the management of male infertility you might be knowing most of the basic stuff we would like to emphasize some things on the basics as well as get an idea regarding the recent advances which you can also help to get some lab tests done and maybe get your expertise in it and help the patient in a holistic way so the agenda for today is assessing the problem how infertility has affected us over the years as you know lot of modern times bring modern problems so infertility as such has increased world over there are many other causes of infertility which was not seen maybe 20 30 years ago because of our lifestyle and we would like to see what's new there in semen analysis a little bit hint on genetic analysis a little bit talk on hormonal aspects of infertility and then male so obviously we have to touch the subject on varicocele which is a major concern and lastly let's just see what's all can be done in the field of artificial reproductive therapy so infertility as you know is the inability to produce a pregnancy within a reasonable period of trying that is the patient couple should be staying together usually for minimum 6 to 12 months we usually don't evaluate people below 12 months but if the patients are little older like above 40 elderly couple the husband is suddenly going away for a long period of time like in gulf it's reasonable that after 6 months of regular unprotected intercourse if there is no pregnancy we can actually evaluate both of them for infertility we should evaluate both the male and female in an equal way because you see that out of total 15% do have a problem of infertility and in in that about 50% of the problem is with the male so we should evaluate both the couples even if the female alone comes up for evaluation and as you know the in our parlance we treat infertility as primary and secondary primary means the patient has not conceived the couple has not conceived before and secondary is where they have conceived before but then in the later time when they try they are not able to conceive this is a, due to an entirely different set of causes mainly related to lifestyle any other hormonal problems maybe due to either diabetes which comes later in life due to varicose in males or any surgeries which they undergo or even thyroid causes lot of causes will be there in secondary so we'll need the detailed history taking especially when it comes to a case of secondary infertility i hope all of you are familiar with the figure it is just a cross section of the seminiferous tubule in which the uh, inside the testis where we have the sanct environment of production of sperm there is a blood testis barrier which you always also all know which prevents the all the toxins from blood and the immunological factors from blood entering into the seminiferous tubes and the basal layers mainly have we have the spermatogonia which are self replicating and they undergo mitosis and then meiosis to halve the number of chromosomes and ultimately they give rise to spermatids spermatids mature by themselves by attaching on to these central cells which are called sertoli cells which help to nurse the uh, spermatids mature them and you can see the early spermatids are having a uh, short tail uh, relatively thicker cytoplasm whereas mature spermatids will have a very long tail very compact chromatid and a well formed head so this all requires a very concerted effort taking place in an area which is away from the normal immune system and away from the normal temperature of body also because we need at least 2 to 4 degrees cooler temperature for the correct maturation to occur this applies to all mammals as far as we know and this uh maturation from the start till it comes to the uh, mature spermatozoa it takes about 64 days and then if you take into account the time which we take for the sperm from seminiferous tubule to get transported to epididymis and from there via the vas into the prostate finally during ejaculation you are looking at a period of about 3 months so whatever treatment either medical or ayurvedic treatment we give if we have to see that for one cycle of new sperm to form and for the result to be seen we recommend testing only in the gap of around 3 months of semen analysis to see any difference if we have cost according to our medicines 
and if we just take the causes for infertility as a whole you can see that most of the uh, uh, defects are due to idiopathic causes that is we can't pinpoint exactly what is wrong in some other cases the causes will be very crystal clear like you have testicular defects in spermatogenesis which is basically there is something wrong with the cellular level where the inside the cellular tubules where the testis uh, the sperm cells are formed it could be <clears throat> total absence of spermatogonia which is called sertoli only syndrome where the germ cells for the production is not there it could be uh, incomplete maturation where the arrest of maturation occurs beyond a certain point all these are having genetic causes due to which these things don't happen then it could be even some cases where you have sloughing of tissue and uh, due to infections and all where the the environment in which the sperms get produced is lost either due to infection or any other causes like chemotherapy etc now we have the increasing problem in most of our patients which is comorbidities in those patients those who have even in middle age or when in late 30s they have systemic problems endocrine disorders which are all coming up mainly due to lifestyle our diet etc so those who have high bp high sugar high stress levels those who are having uh, thyroid issues those who are overweight all these problems can also lead to secondary changes in our testes and cause uh, decrease sperm count now there are other specific problems relating to sperm transport disorders here there is spermatogenesis going on when the sperms are well formed but they are not getting uh, deposited to the final point it could be occurring at a cellular level where there is decreased motility of sperms like ciliary dyskinesia which is again an inherited disorder it could be problem with obstruction inside the tubules or epidermis which is again a common problem in epidermitis etc where the infection causes fibrosis of the lumen of the epidermis it could be problem with some congenital cyst blocking the ejaculatory duct inside the prostate so all and even physiological problems like neurologic patients having absence of nerve connection to the prostate which causes no ejaculation or retrograde ejaculation all these fall under the sperm transport disorders where you can get a sperm directly by some surgery from the uh, epidermis or testis but you might not have anything to see in the semen sample it might show azospermia so hope is not lost in these cases and as i said earlier anything which comes falls out of this spectrum which we can't have a specific cause comes out of idiopathic male infertility which we have only some cocktail of treatment we can't go by a directed scientific basis can be told in managing these kind of patients so if we look at the general cause of infertility in males we have a small amount of genetic factors where they have some syndromes like klinefelter syndrome which i'll be talking in detail later some deletion of the male by part of critical parts of some genes chromosomes or even some this genetic factors we are going on studying recently and a lot of candidate genes have come up but it's very difficult to cover it in such a short topic and when we as modern medicine we are only learning about it nowadays so we'll just cover a brief part of it later then hormonal factors as you all know any hormonal factor can cause decrease in sperm count in males either it be thyroid any adrenal problems excess of steroids or even diabetes which is a sort of metabolic derangement all this can cause uh, decrease in the sperm counts immunological factors occur mainly when there is an infection there is this disruption of the blood testis barrier which i told earlier which leads to influx of the wbc which kills off the cells and recognizes this sperm as foreign cells which is not our own and the body initiates certain antibodies against the test, uh, against the sperms so this will basically impair the motility of sperms but may not destroy it, but impairs the motility of sperms then in the modern day we have a lot of psychosocial factors stress which all leads to this the patient might have problem not only with the sperm production but with 
uh, having intercourse, having ejaculation, all these problems come to infertility. Same comes with lifestyle, lack of high calorie nutrition, which leads to a lot of oxidative damage in our body and uh, hormone imbalances. Then we should look at history of any surgical interventions. Those who have undergone some hernia surgery, in that cases, the tube might get blocked by later fibrosis. Any history of any trauma to the testis, any torsion. In all these cases, there might be initial insult would be forgotten, but there might be later antibodies, antibodies or even atrophy of one side of the testis. We should look into those details. Then infectious diseases, all both viruses and uh, bacteria can cause all kinds of havoc on testis. And especially now with COVID, we have been seeing that like they destroy our lungs. We have seen a lot of drop in semen counts in those patients who have been followed up later, like after one year. Drugs, whatever drugs which we give to patients, mostly we are concerned about chemotherapy, but certain drugs like high dose antibiotics and uh, steroids, etc., can also, and people who use drugs for recreation and uh, for patients who go to gym who use testosterone. All can affect fertility by altering the hormone balance. Now, world over, there has been a problem of decline in fertility. Compared to our forefathers, each and subsequent generations since last 40 years have been having decrease in sperm count. So, when they studied world over, the average sperm count per ejaculate has decreased by almost threefold from 330 million to 137 million in a study which has been done over the last few years. And so we have also reduced the reference values because we can't tell that prior high values are normal. So year by year, the values have decreased. So we'll just, we can just have a look at the latest values. There has been 2014, uh, 2014 recommendations there, but there are not much change from the 2010. So we'll just concentrate on the 2010 manual. So the minimum volume should be 1.5 ml. The count should be 15 million. The total count per ejaculate should be around somewhere around 40 million. And the motility, which is both rapid progressive and slow progressive, that motility as a total percentage of your sample should be usually more than 40%. And if you look at the vitality, vitality is those firms which are viable, but may be motile or immotile. It should be quite high, it should be around 60%. And it can be, if you apply strict morphological criteria, you might be wondering why morphology is only kept at such a low percentage of 4%. Here we are using some very strict criteria for identifying with the hypermicroscope, the anatomy of the head, the compaction of chromatin in the body, the tail to head ratio, all those things. We are using very strict criteria. 4% is enough to get a good pass of the sample. And last thing we have is round cells, which are reported in the uh, seven analysis. It's actually not round cell. It is either leukocyte or mature sperm cells, which don't have tail. So for this, you need a specialized, in our laboratories, we usually do. Unless you send for a specific test, you usually get a round cells. So it doesn't mean that pus, round cells or pus cells. It doesn't mean that these uh, pus cells high means it is due to infection. You have to do special staining for the uh, slide and then see if there are, they are either leukocytes or round cells or any other epithelial cells which assume a round shape. So if you have a WBC properly, which is increased inside the seven sample, it indicates a lot of inflammation, which either could be bacterial, infective or due to autoimmunity. In that cases, what happens is that there is a large load of reactive oxygen species deposited by the leukocytes, which is toxic to the uh, semen and the sperm cells die an early death in these cases. So if you look at the volume of uh, ejaculate in a semen, the majority comes from seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles are tasked with producing some mucoid material, mainly seminogelins, which help in initial coagulation of semen, which helps to uh, decrease the falling out after deposition in the vagina. Prostate gives about 20 to 25%. It is more acidic in secretion and has 
some enzymes which break down the cellular vesicle mucinous products so that later on the sperms get freed from the thick coagulum and only 5 to 10% comprises the active part of sperm which is the spermatozoa which comes from the testis and epididymis so if you look at the logic of it first it comes from the testis then joins in the seminal vesicles where it gets mixed and then only during ejaculation it gets mixed along with the prostatic secretions and comes out so if you have any hypoplasia of seminal vesicles or any obstruction of the ducts only the prostatic part of secretion will come out so the amount will be very less then fructose is produced from the mainly the epididymis so if you look at seven fructose it will be negative and the overall volume as you know will be low and because it's from prostate it is only acidic usual ph is around 7 or 8 which is alkaline so acidic semen low volume and fructose negative you should look at obstructive causes of uh, azospermia or oligospermia now coming at the difficult problem which is azospermia here at the outset it's, itself you have a alarming symptom that is the, there is no uh, sperm cells at all in your sample but you should not worry with one sample because once a person ejaculates if he ejaculates maybe the next day you can have false azospermia in some cases usually we tell about uh, abstinence period of 3 days and fourth day you have to give the semen analysis and if this is violated you can have falsely low counts so you should have a sperm sample of at least two separate samples taken two weeks apart to diagnose azospermia in these cases the semen sample is again centrifuge made into a pellet and examined on microscope and only then we can give a conclusive report of azospermia and uh, in azospermia the the main diagnosis is between lack of production versus obstruction so what happens is that if there is lack of production or any pro problem with the testis you find that the patient will have a small testis size on examination and since the testis is size is less we see that the brain use of lot of fsh to try to stimulate the testis to grow up but this is this has happened so in the blood test you will have a elevated fsh and on examination a small testis whereas in obstruction everything is going on well so the testis will be normal in size the fsh will be normal but because of obstruction you are finding there is no sperm in the sample so in these cases we can directly get to get into an idea like what we are dealing with but in some cases there may be a combination of both like i mean a slightly damaged testis from prior infection and that infection causing little bit of obstruction also so in these cases we take the help of testicular biopsy and during the biopsy itself we will try to in ivf centers we will try to get a sample of sperm collected from the uh, sample during processing itself and cryo freeze it so that we can use it for later use if the patient is trying for ivf therapy the other important thing which has come up is automated sperm analysis which is called casa here the computer itself we lay down specific amounts of semen in various areas or chambers and the microscope does its own analysis by using artificial intelligence where they map the progressive motility non progressive motility as even even immortal spermatozoa using the cameras and even certain other factors like the velocity measures of each sperm can be measured and we can have a more idea regarding the uh, sample compared to the routine manual semen analysis now coming to various other tests just for your curiosity all this test semen analysis give an idea about count motility other than that we don't have any idea whether these are viable whether these have good amount of good quality of the chromosomes whether there is any other damaging factor inside the seminal plasma all these things we have to in advanced centers we use certain other kind of tests like if the plasma membrane integrity is not there once the semen comes sperm swims out of its own normal plasma into the vaginal secretions it might lose its uh, osmotic balance and get swollen and die off 
So plasma integrity, plasma memory integrity test by using a microscope and using some other pH solution will be used. And for viability, we use different kind of test, which only dead cells will not take up, only the living cells will take up. And to see the viability of acrosome, acrosome is needed for fertilization by disrupting the X shell, which is called zona pellucida. So to see if everything is intact, we have acrosomal status assessing test. The other important thing is DNA fragmentation, which we'll talk to you in a bit detail. Here, the more DNA damage is there, the DNA fragmentation index will increase. And we have two or three tests which help in assessing this, especially in recurrent abortions or when failed IVF two, three, three times. We can use these tests and counsel the patient whether they should go forward or maybe take up any other uh, option like artificial donation or adoption. Now, reactive oxygen species measurement is another thing which is coming up. Here, it might be either due to infection or even other inflammatory disorders. Here, little bit of reactive oxygen species is native to the cement. It is important to get the acrosomal activation, the dissolution of the eggshell. All is done by the reactive oxygen species. But once it is too high, it may damage the sperm itself. So a correct balance of the reactive oxygen species measurement is important when we have any unexplained infertility. And we have latest things like flow cytometry, where just when, like you do CBC, CBC also uses complete blood count analysis uses flow cytometry. We don't do it manually. Here, there are many microtubes and laser, sign, laser shines on them. And once each cell passes over, we can get a count very accurately in a very short while. Similarly, we can have an idea regarding the uh, type of sperm cells that are immature or mature, uh, all the count, even any other things which we can tag on the, some markers we can tag on the cement and it will get absorbed to the sperm cells. And if you want to know any characteristics of those kind of cells, by passing the sperm through this flow cytometers, we can have an idea about the how much percentage of the uh, sperm cells are taking up that particular marker. So the DNA fragmentation is one thing which I think you should all be knowing of. Here it should be used in most cases of repeated IUI or IVF failure, recurrent spontaneous abortions, especially in the first mm -hmm. trimester. If there is IVF and then there is very low fertilization, implantation, or even forming of embryos, in these cases, we should look at DNA fragmentation index. And in some cases where the patient is having varicocele but normal sperm count, but still female is normal, but you are not able to fertilize, then you can have a look at sperm DNA fragmentation because it won't be seen via microscope. And nowadays with advanced male age, in most of the marriages, we are recommending sperm DNA fragmentation if there is one or two early abortions, not so as to not waste time. Then a short talk on genetic testing in male infertility. It is recommended in only very few cases. So mainly if you are dealing with severely oligospermic, say less than four or five million total count or in azospermia, in those cases, in selected cases, we can go for genetic testing. So the aim is just to not only find something, but we have to prevent it. If it is going to be passed on to his son or child, we, if the patient is carrying certain genetic conditions, we should identify it and counsel the patient so that they know that if they're going to have a child, the child will also have the same genetic problem, which leads to infertility. And uh, there are a spectrum of conditions in genetic causes which affects the infertility. There are mild causes where you can find, you will be having azospermia in the semen analysis. But if you take a biopsy, one or two sites may be having isolated sites of uh, sperm production. And by using a testicular mapping biopsy, you can get the yield for IVF. In some cases, there is a spectrum of other end also where some genetic testing, if you get a result, you can tell the patient that there is no hope. So you have to go for either artificial donor or something like that. You can see that as the 
stability of the oligospermia, cryptospermia, or azospermia increases, then we find an increasing amount of genetic abnormalities. We are mainly concerned about three broad causes of genetic causes of infertility. First is Kleinfelter syndrome. As you know, males usually have XY. Here, an extra X chromosome comes due to mutation. And in those cases, we will need a karyotype analysis. Then we have other uh, group of diseases called micro deletions of the Y chromosome. Here, the very important areas of Y chromosome which are concerned with the hormone expression in testis and production of the sperms are affected. It is usually subdivided to A, B, and C. Again, in some cases, like even if the microdelish is there and if it's type C, you can have a testicular mapping biopsy and try to get the one or two samples of sperms from IVF. And this microdelition is usually detected by fish, which is a technique where fluorescent in situ hybridization is where you put some markers on the uh, sperm and if they take it up you can use a ultraviolet light and through microscope it will light up like do so in green then another most important cause of genetic infertility is cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis as you know is a ciliary motility disorder where there is uh, problems with the lungs due to not able to clear the sputum in these cases a particular thing happens in males where the vas, as you know, which transports the cement from epidermis to the uh, prostate is absent unilaterally or bilaterally. So in these cases and all, in all these cases, you find that the... That is, in all these cases, you find that there is a high chance of transmitting these disorders to the offspring. And we do a simultaneous analysis of the genetics of the female. And if they are going to be having two carriers, which means that the child is almost sure to get it, we counsel against having a baby in those cases. Are you familiar with the hormonal control and feedback of pituitary? We'll just uh, glance through it. You know, hypothalamus releases the GNRX to anti pituitary which produces both LH and FSH. LH is luteinizing hormone, which comes to the Leydig cells of testis, which produces testosterone. Now this testosterone acts as a break. It goes back to the brain and tells it to stop producing. So whenever this same goes with the uh, sertoli cells, they produce inhibit. So these two factors go back into the brain and tell the brain to stop producing excess GNR. So it acts as a Self-regulating loop. When you're, whenever you have any problem with hypothalamus or pituitary, which you cause, call as central cause of hypogonadism, you will have a very low LH, FSH, as well as GNRH. Now, whenever you have a problem with the end organ, which is the testis, what happens is the testis will not produce testosterone. So the testosterone will be low, inhibit will be low, but there is no feedback loop acting on the brain to tell it to stop producing LH and FSH. So in these cases, LH and FSH will be high. The fourth point is that if you find a patient with the low testosterone, all the hypoandrogenic features and low central markers like GNRX, LH and FSH, in these cases, you should suspect a central cause of and that is hypothalamic hypogonadism. In those cases, you will have to refer it to a neuro, uh, neurologist and get a MRI brain done. Whereas if it is primary failure of testis due to any of these genetic causes, due to any secondary causes like trauma, infection, all these cases, what happens is that the source will be less because the testis is uh, gone bad, but the brain will be producing more and more LH and FSH to tell it to try to act. And in these cases, the practical use of this thing is that if you have very high LH and FSH and a small testis, low testosterone, it means that 
your testis production is so bad that even if you do biopsy, in these cases, the hope is very less. So in fact, if we have a very high SSX range, which is more than four times of normal, we practically don't advise doing even a testicular biopsy. Because in those cases, it is very unlikely to get any yield from the testis. So if you look at the history, you have a, you should go right from the development history. Was there any problem with the undescended testis? Because a patient with undescended testis has an inherent problem of the development of the testis also. It's not only the problem with the, uh, coming down from the abdomen to the groin, into the scrotum, there will be problem, same problem which causes it not to descend, which also will have it some other problems like uh, low sperm count, problems with the seminiferous tubules, etc. And also they will have maybe a testosterone deficiency also. Then in other patients, reduced sexual desire, erectile dysfunction, male breast discomfort, male gynecomastia, all these are also symptoms suggesting hypo androgenism, low testosterone levels. These patients will also have decreased energy, depressed mood, and chronic diseases also will cause the same problems like uncontrolled diabetes, TB, which is not treated, drug abuse, use of other steroids, long-term steroids, hypothyroid, cirrhotic patients, all will have, cirrhotic patients will have disorders of test, testosterone metabolism, so they will have low testosterone. So, Hormone tests are usually advised only if there is a less than 15 million sperm count and also along with it some other problems like impaired sexual function or your findings like I said earlier point to small testes, any endocrinopathies or any uh, pituitary problems like eye vision problems etc. which causes compression on the optic nerve and uh, due to the swelling of First the uterus. MS38. So this I have already covered. Next week. So coming to other aspect of male infertility is varicocele. Varicocele, as you all know, is the enlargement of the small veins of the testis. Testicular veins and arteries have a particular relation. They are closely entangled by themselves and the veins are very much thin walled. So any increase in pressure can lead to over time engorgement of these veins and causes varicocele. The arrangement of the veins and artery are such that it will have a cross current effect. That is, it will cause cooling of the incoming arterial blood supply by the venous return, which comes from outside our body. Because the scrotum is located outside the body, it is at a lower temperature. And this countercurrent mechanism helps in further decreasing the uh, temperature of the testis from the normal body temperature. There is supposedly an exchange of some metabolites and hormones between the artery and vein, which helps in maintaining high local androgen levels. So any enlargement in this vein is called varicocele. Now, what happens when there is a varicocele? There will be a sluggish flow. There will be stoppage of uh, flow in the veins, decreased oxygen levels, higher temperatures. It occurs to tell uh, lots of causes, like chronic constipation causing pressure on the vein from the loaded sigmoid column, those who are standing for a long period of time, and uh, some vascular and abnormalities in the area which we go and drain into the IVC or renal vein. The, in all these cases, there will be engorgement of the veins. It contributes up to 40 cases of primary infertility. And in secondary infertility, the chance of having a varicocele in a male is increased up to 80%. But we can never be sure that this varicocele is 100% the cause of infertility because once we repair it, we find only that up to 60% of cases will have a successful pregnancy within one year. So there are various other factors at play rather than only the varicocele, which might be an incidental finding because up to seen that about uh, one in six of normal people have some degree of varicocele. And there is always controversy in, in our field that whether we should treat all varicoceles, especially if they are not coming for infertility. 
especially in adolescents. So, varicocele is made by a cursory examination. You see the bag of bones like this through the skin. And only if you have some doubt or if it's a fatty person, you can't get a particular, you can't get a correct diagnosis, do you have to need to do ultrasound? Otherwise, just an examination is enough. So, the various theories which are there, which causes damage to the uh, sperm count in the varicocele is that in the vein brains, as I said earlier, on the left side to the renal vein, the gonadal vein. So, reflex of adrenal metabolites directly from the opening of the renal vein into the varicocele causes some toxicity in the kidney. The temperature increases, as I said earlier, there's hypoxia. All this causes molecular level changes, like and genetic changes and elevated oxidative stress. And the output of all these negative things is that there is decreased sperm production, motility, abnormal morphology. And as it increases, as the damage increases, it goes from decreased motility and down all the way to decreased, increased DNA damage. And the patient presents by having either pain, infertility, or in severe cases like bilateral severe varicocele. Those who have had it from the adolescents, they might have hypogonadism. So, in general, we give an indication to surgery only in bilateral grade 2 varicocele or a single-sided grade 3 varicocele. Obviously, symptomatic you will have to do it because the pain is due to the varicocele. If there is testicular hypertrophy, that is, if you see both testes, 20% difference in volume is there. Then we recommend if the side, same side is having varicocele, we recommend treatment of varicocele even if it is like a smaller grade, not grade 3. And in some patients, those who have already have some other testicular disease, already the testis is damaged, we don't want additional damage from the varicocele. So even if the grade is slightly lower also, we advocate surgical treatment in these patients. And obviously, if you have had abnormal sub analysis, no other causes there, but the varicose is not very big. You have treated him for a long time. You can very well do a varicose surgery by giving him an informed opinion regarding the chance of recovery and chance of recovery of uh, the sperm function. And after giving him the correct information, we can give a trial of surgery in these cases. Now, let's have some, a look at some of the infections which we usually do not look for in patients with infertility. Some patients might have had infection beforehand and uh, all that damage keeps on progressing later without much symptoms. And the onus is on upon us to have a look at, look at whether there are any silent infections or any inflammatory conditions which are affecting the patient. So, patient may not give an upfront history of any uh, epidemiorchitis, urethral discharge, dysuria, or UTI. But if you have a look at the seven analysis, more than 1 million blood cells, white blood cells per sample of ML of sample in seven is the cutoff for the leukocytospermia, which is an indicator for inflammatory or infective cause for infertility. As I said earlier, the reactive oxygen species increases causes cellular damage and also we have anti-sperm antibodies which bind to the sperm and reduces the motility. So the infections could be anywhere between urethritis which is usually caused by chlamydia and neisseria. Then we have prostatitis. It could be caused by whole range of bacteria which affects the normal UTA also. It could be E. coli, Klebsiella, Laprotis, etc. Here what happens is that rather than the normal UTA, the patient will have upon giving chronic dysuria. The urinary might not show anything. Only by doing a rectal examination, you find that the prostate is, is inflamed and tender. And by doing a semen culture only, we can identify this prostatitis. Now the same nesaria and chlamydia will go into the up to the epidermis and cause epidermitis, but it will cause fibrosis on healing. So in these cases, it is a a uh, great contributor to the cause of obstructive azospermia. And as you know, orchitis or mumps is caused by viruses like mumps and even Coxsackie B viruses can cause orchitis. Orchitis in a pre 
adolescent you can get away without any testicular damage but it once in occurs after the puberty the once the blood test is where it has been set up the sperms are not recognized by our body so once the barrier breakdowns after the onset of orchitis you find lot of auto antibodies and delayed atrophy in these cases so you should have a history of any of these problems in the patient while taking a history and now currently we are focusing a lot on lifestyle factors of male infertility which could be due to improper diet both malnutrition as well as high calorie diet obesity and all the metabolic problems it brings along with addictions to both smoking alcohol recreational drug abuse lack of sleep and stress all these causes basically what is that it will be oxidative stress inside the body and ultimately it leads to sperm dna damage and later the dna damage causes whatever you see in semen analysis reflected as decrease in number mortality and morphology so we have dealt with most of the causes of the infertility now let's have a look at what all things we can do to in our raw material to get the patient to retrieve some sperm which is not there in the normal semen so the sure shot answer if you ask what can be done to get a very good sample of sperm if in if all other avenues are exhausted and you have to try to get at least four or five sperms for a ivf the answer will be micro test which is microscopic testicular uh, sperm extraction here what you do is you have a under is usually done under anesthesia you incise the covering of testis you splay it open and you using a microscope identify the potential sites of good areas of uh sperm production inside the seminiferous tubules it can be identified as slightly big compared to the other tubules under the microscopy it is cut and the fluid from there is taken away by a micro pipette and examined and whatever sperms you get are immediately taken away for cryo storage and for use later so like in like i said in certain genetic conditions where you have very few areas of sperm production this is the ultimate answer where you can get a person's uh, sperm if he is adamant on retrieval the other outpatient wise things which we can do is if there is obstruction we can get a direct sample from the testis or the epidermis which is called testicular sperm aspiration or epidermal sperm aspiration you do a epidermal sperm retrieval in most cases but sometimes what happens is that the whole epidermis will be infected craggy and fibrous in those cases we can have the uh, testicular sperm aspiration but the thing is that the sperms need maturation all the way from seminiferous tubules right up to the distal part of epidermis so if you have a chance of getting epidermal sperm retrieval you will get a more mature sperm more chance of fertilization and it will be get better to take an epidermal sperm retrieval sample now some patients will have neurological problems like spinal injury or some chemotherapy which has led to neuronal losses here we have to the patient will not be able to ejaculate so in those cases we either do a penile vibratory stimulation or direct using a transrectal probe we give direct current to the prostate and seminal vesicles which cause which is called as electro ejaculation in these cases even if the patient is not able to produce an ejaculatory sample we can get the sample by artificial means so what do you do with all the sperms which you get when you go into an ivf center so we can have a lot of sources of sperms like from the normal ejaculate in some patients who have undergone a prostate surgery they will have something called as retrograde ejaculation that is the it won't come in front the ejaculate will go back into the bladder it can occur on also some neurogenic causes like uh, spinal injuries etc so in those cases from the urine you can filter out the sperms and take out like after ejaculation ask the patient to pass urine and you can get a uh, urine sample from sperms then as i told epidermal and sperm samples 
and once you get them you can either use this use as fresh or use as cryopreservation so that you can use them at a later time and uh, for assisted procedures we have other types of various types of processing like if it is a freeze sample we use a process known as thawing and uh, for fresh samples to wash away the immunological factors antibodies we do something called washing then we do separation which is basically separate the motile from non motile sperms by making the sperms to swim along a gradient so that you get a highly concentrated motile sperm that's called separation and filtration can be done using artificial membranes or something like that so that you can get any uh, dna damaged sperms by using some molecules to tag on to it you can use some magnets or something to filter the sperms so these are all the procedures which are done in the ivf setting and the assisted procedures include iui which you all know is the intrauterine insemination ivf and icsi icsi is the ultimate answer which we which we take when all the other measures fail it is nothing but you directly inject the intro cytoplasmic injection of the sperm cell directly using a selected sperm using a micro pipette into the ovum so whatever we do the ultimate goal of the sperm processing in a unit associated with infertility is to obtain a small but enriched quantity of motile as well as functional sperms so you can see the objectives are all we have to concentrate the motile sperm remove the unwanted debris and seminal plasma and uh, add some buffers into the solution which will help in keeping the sperm more viable and neutralize some oxidative processes which may be more than required so just a look at the previous things which i mentioned you have a centrifugation where you can get motile sperm lower down in the centrifuge you can have a climb up of the sperms where you just keep it at 45 degree use different processing medium and uh, more viable cells climb up into the density gradient and you can take off all only the mobile sperms then you have magnetic activated sperm sorting then if you are going to little higher stuff we have hyaluronic acid binding because we find that in some cases they want the sperm will not bind with the zona pellucida of the egg so you ask the you put the sperms in a solution containing hyaluronic acid you find the cells which are binding with it and only retrieve those with a micro pipette and inject and then we have the motile sperm organelle morphological morphology examination which is nothing but seven or six of the times magnification is done all the small even golgi apparatus and all the small small organelles of the sperm the compaction of chromatin everything is assessed by our eye visually and a highly selected sperm like in a very very poor quality semen by using very high magnification even one or two good sperms can be obtained rather than going for testicular extraction etc so these are the recent advances so overall if you look that in iui and conventional ivf you just need a not coming okay. in iui and conventional ivf methods we just need a simple wash or density gradient centrifugation use uh, sperm migration techniques whereas in advanced techniques like ivf or icsi where the situation is so bad that the semen quality is so bad you have to get a very high quality of semen so in these cases we do some additional things like pre incubation with pentoxifilin the one which i mentioned earlier the imc which is the high microscopic selection of sperms hyaluronic binding assays and other microfluidic devices to get the highest quality sperm possible i want to the last bit of the topic we are having these of cancers worldwide even in youngsters we are seeing that all these cancer patients will have problems of fertility obviously after the chemotherapy or treatment or radiation whatever 
some people especially western world are now looking at unmarried people they are giving the option of they know that is going to damage the sperms they are giving the patients the option of having the fertility preserved before going in for a cancer treatment so let's see what's going on in the world regarding this problem so whatever it, it be chemotherapy surgery or radiation all these effects the sperm count equally in very many many ways it can alter directly by causing toxic to spermatogenesis by altering the hormone levels causing sexual dysfunction by depression neurological problems and overall health is being lost due to chronic medical problems so all that ultimately reflects on four seven parameters so in these cases we offer them sperm cryo preservation before onset of your uh, chemotherapy or surgery especially in testicular cancers then in some patients in the post chemotherapy setting if the patient has azospermia using the modern methods which i have all told like including the micro tees we can have an about 40% chance of sperm retrieval so this option can be given to patients even if they fail to improve counts with medicines and correcting all the other problems and giving them time to recover if all these things fails we can still have 40% chance of taking out sperms from micro tees then ejaculatory ejaculatory dysfunction as i all told <coughs> told later we can use either uh, vibratory stimulation or electro ejaculation then two things which are going on which has been tested at the animal level is immature testicular tissue transplant where the if his patient is especially going and undergoing an orchidectomy we can take the cancer out and see the non cancer part of the testis and transplant the testicular tissue into some other part of our body later after cryo freezing it's done in uh, mouse and all but not in our um, patients then we have spermatogonial stem cell transplant which is nothing but all the stem cells which is spermatogonia are taken away from the body before the chemotherapy and kept in a medium and there are now Uh, certain studies where they are trying to get outside our body maturation of the spermatogonia and help them to produce sperms in a setting outside the testis so i think this brings an end to our topic and i thank you all for the patience